All right. Hey, everyone. So thank you for coming to today's webinar. We, in celebration of DAF Day, Donor Advice Fund Day, on October 10th here, we are joined um, by our, well, he'll be hosting and talking a lot about the research he has done in relation to DAFs. Dr. Dan Heist is on the call with us. So we have the opportunity to learn all about his DAF research and he will dive into that in just a few moments, but we will give it about a minute for people to join. Um, if you have to leave for whatever reason, feel free to, as we will be sending out the recording either later today or early tomorrow, typically, um, or at least within the next few business days. Um, alongside us also is Daniel Blake from UI Charitable. So he'll be sharing a little bit too um, and what UI Charitable does in the DAF space and how they can be helpful to you as advisors. And then myself, uh, I'm Emily Wetter. I am here from Holista Plan. I am representing the customer success team today and I'll be demo demoing just a little bit in the software right at the end. So if you came wondering how would I do this in Holista Plan, uh, we will show you that as well. So we, we, our count is just over 100, about 120 guys. That is awesome. Um, if, if you want to, I know we have quite a bit, a lot of material. So we want to kind of pull up this, the screen here and do some further introductions if necessary. Um, I think we can go ahead. Perfect. Great. Excellent. Um, Dan, if you want to give just a little bit of background about yourself, and I, I know you have a lot to say about DAF, so if you can just, you know, speak to the research that we're going to be learning about today, that would be awesome. Sure. Thanks, Emily. I just want to thank Emily, Alyssa Plan, and, and Dan and Sarah at, at UI Charitable Advisors for inviting me to join you today. My name is Dan Heist. I'm on the faculty at Brigham Young University, where I teach nonprofit management and fundraising. Uh, I have a background in uh, major gifts, major gift uh, fundraising. So uh, about nine years as a professional fundraiser, uh, have worked closely with with many families using donor advice funds as a, a product that uh, helps them with uh, their charitable giving. And just looking forward to digging into the research a little bit more with you. Emily, do you want me to go ahead and start, or uh, are you and Dan going to introduce yourselves as well right now, or are we saving that for later? Well, I'll give Dan a chance to introduce himself so he can uh, clarify anything that I, I did not clarify with my very brief introduction. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. It's always a, a pleasure being here. My name is Dan Blake. I'm the CEO at UI Charitable Advisors. Um, we specialize in donor advice funds, and after... Uh, Dan Heist goes through all of his research. I'll be sharing uh, uh, just one strategy, which is hope, hopefully really helpful and just really practical on how donor advice funds can be implemented with your individual clients. So Emily, thank you so much for uh, for having us. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you both for joining on today's call in celebration of October 10th, DAF Day. Um, and once again, I'm Emily Wetter um, from Holista Plan on the customer success team. I help onboard um, and work with a lot of our new users to the platform, so help them get comfortable with the software overall. So right at the end, I'll hop into Holista Plan so you can see some of this brought to life if uh, you were joining for purposes of modeling what we're learning today. Um, throughout the webinar. So Dan, if you want to take it away. Sounds great. Thanks again, Emily, for having me and looking forward to spending this time with you. Hopefully we can answer some of your questions about donor advice funds and have a uh, rich and meaningful conversation. I do want to just let you know, please feel free to put any questions in the in the chat uh, on, on any of the content that we cover and we'll have time at the end to take questions and cover questions. So with that, uh, so I'm I'm one of the co-founders of what's called the Donor Advised Fund Research Collaborative. We've been operating for about seven years now. Um, I was, uh, as I mentioned, a major gifts officer uh, and, and was a professional fundraiser for several years uh, and went back to do some doctoral studies, realized that no one has really researched donor advised funds. They're this kind of new and uh, increasingly popular tool that people are using, and no one was really doing a whole lot of 
uh, research on them. So some colleagues and I around the country uh, have uh, done some research that we're hoping to present, I'll be presenting today. But I first wanna just really quickly uh, in the chat, just would you mind just giving us a sense of how familiar are you with donor advice funds, right? So not at all familiar would be, this is kind of the first time I'm hearing about them. Uh, somewhat familiar is, yeah, I, I know the basics of, of, of what it is. Uh, and then familiar is like, yeah, maybe you've worked with the donor advice fund a little bit. And then very familiar is in maybe your day-to-day -day is, is, is involving donor advice funds. So just looking in the chat, trying to get a sense of, of level of familiarity here. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so mostly kind of in the somewhat familiar to familiar, a few not familiar. Great. Okay, this is this is helpful. I think what we'll do is we'll get started. Uh, I'll just introduce a little bit more my team uh, as I see this come in. Uh, so uh, I have colleagues around the country that we work with. Um, these are all professionals who are in the philanthropic space, just grateful uh, for the collaboration. We work really together, but we also work with many of the DAF sponsoring organizations around the country. Uh, just want to orient you to the, the growth of the last 10 years. So uh, donor advice funds are becoming really, really popular, right? So we're, uh, you know, in 2022, about 2 million accounts in the U.S., which has experienced tremendous growth in the last 10 years. Uh, assets are in the, you know, around 200 billion plus uh, in, in, in DAFs, but you can also see the money coming in is the contributions on the bottom left and the money leaving DAFs uh, on the right are the grants made. So around you know, up, upwards of $50 billion a year uh, in money ma making being granted out of DAFs. So these are extremely popular. I just wanted to set a baseline here for how they work for those who are uh, maybe not so familiar or, or only somewhat familiar with donor advised funds. Uh, what happens is if you have a client that wants to do some charitable giving, uh, the client will make a, a tax deductible contribution into an account that's being held by uh, a, a nonprofit sponsoring organization like UI Charitable Advisors. Uh, and that, that contribution can be a lot of different things. And Dan will talk, uh, Dan Blake will talk a little bit more in, in, in a sec about like, you know, the different kinds of assets that they're seeing come in, but, but it could be real estate, it could be securities, uh, it could be closely held business interests, uh, it could be just cash. Uh, but, but the idea is they make a contribution into this account and that is immediately tax deductible uh, because that is a contribution to a 501c3. And the organization, the sponsoring organization will hold that account and they'll manage it. They'll invest it. They'll 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 manage those funds, uh, and uh, the donor typically has some say over how they want the funds to be invested, whether it's long term or short term, depending on their strategy. Um, and then eventually, that donor will advise the the organization, the sponsoring organization, on how and where they want to give that money to other charities. And so that's why it's called a donor advised fund. Um, technically speaking, the, the sponsoring organization has the fiduciary responsibility for the funds, but they, they will take the advice from the donor on how to use it. And so um, those are the basics for how a donor advice fund works. Again, if you have any questions about the, the kind of basics, feel free to put uh, any questions in the chat and we'll, we'll try and answer, uh, answer that. But those are the basic mechanics. Now, Next slide, I'd love for your feedback, right? So some of you are, are, are familiar or very familiar uh, with donor advice funds. Why, why are these popular? Why are people uh, uh, flocking to use this, uh, this new tool? I'd love to see in the chat uh, what you're seeing in, in your own practices. Why are donor advice funds, why do people like them? Okay, so complex, let's see. Okay, so Ben asked if we have a more complex donor advice fund situation. Yeah, yeah. So there are definitely people that can help you uh, advise. Dan, we'll get to that. Yeah, ease of use. Good. There's one tax form, right? You make one contribution. Uh, you do all your giving out of this one account. And then at the end of the year, if you're itemizing, you've just got one receipt for the IRS. Good. Also, tax issues, right? Yeah. So timing with taxes, flexible, easy. Yeah, easy to set up. Great. Anonymous giving. Yep. Thanks, Kathy. That's definitely a, a perk for some people. Uh, front loading their giving. Good. We'll talk about uh, bunching in a little bit. Good, good. So I think you're seeing a lot of them, right? So the immediate tax deduction, time for grant making, right? Donors like having a little extra time uh, to decide where they're gonna give. Low cost, easy to use, right? You know, you could, if you wanted to go on and set up a donor advice fund. Actually, I, I teach a class uh, 
a fundraising class to my students and my students have to set up a donor advice fund as part of the class. By the end of this, this uh, webinar, you could go on and set up a donor advice fund somewhere and, and, and typically they're pretty easy to set up. Um, so easy to use, low cost, non-cash assets, right? That you wanna give away that, that piece of real estate, uh, uh, but you, you're not sure if you wanna give it all to one charity, the, the DAF can take the, the, the real estate and then you can divide up uh, that money to different charities, investment growth. People like the idea that it, it grows while it's in the account. Um, potential for anonymity as has been mentioned. Um, it simplifies record keeping and then also family involvement. I, I don't know if anyone mentioned that, but um, we are seeing some pretty good evidence that people are involving kids, grandkids, next gen uh, in their philanthropic giving using a donor advised fund. Okay. I wanna orient you really quickly to some of our research. Uh, this is just out this last year. We had a national study of donor advised funds. We, we worked with 111 sponsoring organizations all around the country, including some of the large national programs, lots of community foundations, religious organizations like Jewish federations. Uh, we, we collected 57,000, over 57,000 accounts, uh, data on 57,000 accounts for nine years. So we got to see money in, money out, year over year, actually daily uh, record transactions of, of money coming in and out of DAFs for 57,000 accounts over nine years. So lots of really great data here. I'll share some of the highlights today, but I'll, I'll uh, indicate that, you know, the report is available online. You can dig in more there. Um, but what the other piece that we did over the summer, we sent out a survey. Uh, we partnered with some of these same organizations all around the country, uh, sent out a survey to donor advisors. So, and we had over 2000 donor advisors take the survey um, and uh, we'll share some of the, the results from that as well. Um, so first, I just want to give you a, a broad picture of who's using donor advice funds. Okay, so this is the this is the income ranges coming from the survey. So we see that kind of medium income range. Here is is kind of in that uh, you know two hundred thousand to five hundred thousand. So uh, a little bit higher income range than than average American, as can be expected. But we still have uh, quite a few people using it at, at lower income ranges. Um, in terms of net worth, uh, definitely over that. Uh, one million dollar uh, net worth. Uh, again, we in the survey we asked people to think about their house, to think about all their assets. Um, but this is the typical client who's using a donor advised fund. Happy to share these slides with you. I'm going to move a little bit quickly so we can get to some of the more in, um, important findings. But this is the size of the donor advised fund account. So uh, these buckets are you know zero to one, one to five thousand, five to ten, ten to fifty, fifty to hundred. But what we're really seeing is uh, donor advice funds are being used for people who want to give more than they typically would give using a checkbook and less than they would typically give if they were opening a private foundation. So it's really kind of that sweet spot uh, for that kind of mid-range philanthropic uh, uh, family that's that's wanting to do some serious philanthropic giving, uh, but wants something a little bit more strategic, a little bit more um, uh, uh, versatile than just either giving a checkbook and a little bit less expensive and less uh, hard to set up than a private foundation, okay? Um, what we're seeing here too, we asked people, you know, how 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 sophisticated are you with with giving to give charity, right? Like how, how involved are you? Uh, so we're seeing, you know, only about one fifth of the people that, who are using donor advice funds say, I, I don't really know anything at all about uh, charitable giving. Um, and a lot of those people are setting up because they understand some of the tax benefits here. Uh, but, you know, for the most part, people are somewhat knowledgeable or, or even expert on giving to charity. So these are people that kind of know what they wanna do in general. They they have some sense of the, the kind of charitable giving. So if you have clients that are involved in charitable giving that kind of are, are already kind of in this space, uh, this, this could be a really good tool for them. Now we're gonna take a look at using some of that data that we collected. You know, what's going on? How are they being used? So. The first thing I want to show you is donor advice funds are also being used in conjunction with other philanthropic vehicles, right? So the direct gift is just, you know, checkbook, credit card, online giving kind of stuff. But we see people using the IRA rollover. I will note that uh, the a donor advice fund is not a, a qualified charitable distribution and not, it cannot take uh, IRA rollovers, but people are doing kind of both at the same time. Uh, but people giving directly stocks, uh, about 4% of people were also using private foundation. So this can be a tool that can be used in conjunction with other types of charitable giving. Um, I do want to note here that we're tracking 
people who are, who are putting money into DAFs often do so more than once. And some people are doing it every year. So this is a tool that can be used year over year and can be used as needed, uh, but it's not usually a one and done kind of thing. It's usually kind of, you know, you'll kind of re-up or when it's right to, to use it again. So it's something that people are kind of continually using uh, again and again. In any given year, about 60% of people who have a DAF will put more in, in, that, in that year, okay? We're gonna look now at the timing of when people put money into their DAF and when people put money or move money out of their DAF or make a grant. Um, so that orange line uh, that, that we see is the money coming into donor advised funds. And obviously we got that kind of hockey stick curve uh, where year end people are thinking about their taxes and tax implications for charitable giving and they're, they're moving money into the donor advised fund account. The dark bluish line uh, is money coming out of the do donor advised fund. And so we see that people are not as beholden to the calendar year uh, in, in moving money out. This is good news for professional fundraisers who can kind of make that major gift ask in March or April and not feel like they have to worry about kind of uh, year end implications. So this gives you a sense of the timing of money coming in and money coming out of DAFs. This is uh, an interesting graph. I'm gonna take just a sec to explain this. Often people ask us, how long does money stay in a donor advice fund? What's the typical shelf life for money? And so what this graph does is it, it's a little bit complicated, but it, it shows you the variety of the shelf lives of different donor advised funds. Again, this is 57,000 accounts over nine years. So what you're seeing here is in that year zero, that, that bar on the left, uh, that's the year that they open the account. And, and most people are not, about 60% of people are not doing anything, any grant making that, that first year. Um, you know, if we had you on screen, I'd kind of ask you a little bit, actually, maybe you can even put in the chat. Why would you think people are not making a grant out of their DAF that first year that they're setting it up? If anyone has any, any thoughts on that, feel free to put that in the chat. Again, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, a professor side. So okay, good. So Ashley says that they want to see the growth, the timing. Yep. Kirk. Good. Still deciding? Good. Yeah, so they're wanting it to grow maybe a little bit. The timing, remember, the money coming in is a lot of it's coming in at the year end. So if you're moving money in, you know, the first of December or, or even midway through December, you probably don't have a lot of time to make decisions, right? But what we're seeing is by year one, two, three, most people are moving either all of their money or up to, you know, 50, 60, 70% of their money. So in, in years two, three, but we do have this one group of people that bought that bottom row, that dark brown, are people that are kind of leaving it in there for long-term giving. So this gives you a sense of the variety of ways that people are using the DAF. And, and some people move it out really quickly. Most people move it out fairly quickly. Some people kind of keep it in there for longer term. Okay, so this is a shelf life. Now I want to move to um, another study that we did where we sat down and we interviewed. Uh, this was before the pandemic, actually. So we did a lot in, in, in person or over Zoom. But we interviewed people who were using donor advised funds. This was all around the country. We partnered with Stanford University. We partnered with others. We, it was not just higher ed givers. but uh, And we interviewed 48 uh, 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 people who were using donor advised funds all around the country, very kind of a range of of big accounts, you know, small accounts. And we just asked them, tell us, you know, what are you doing? How are you using the DAF? Why, why is this a good tool for you? And, and one of the things we started seeing as we were talking to people were some patterns. And I want to indicate those patterns for you today, uh, because I think this will help you think about your clients and the different kinds of ways that people are using donor advised funds uh, and, and if you can kind of recognize what approach your client might be taking will help you give them the best advice that, to, to use the DAF in, the, in a way that's right for them. So here, here are the patterns. All right, bear with me. I know this is uh, might be, look a little bit funny, but there's, there's, there's a, a method to my madness. So I started talking about this study with a community foundation leader in, in, uh, in Midwest and was telling him, man, we're interviewing these people. And some people, and this was a big surprise to us. Some people move money in and move money out every year. And they just like, they'll put $100,000 in and they'll move the $100,000 out. And they just kind of move it in and out every year, in and out. And he said, oh yeah, that's that's our bathtub donors. I was like, bathtub donors? What do you mean bathtub donors? He said, yeah, they fill it, then they drain it. They fill it when they need it, then they drain it when they're done. And, and then it kind of resonated with us. And we thought, okay, bathtub donors, we got it. So we stuck with the water analogy and we started looking at the other patterns of the other donors. 
And we realized that there were three basic types of, of people using uh, donor advice funds. There were the bathtubs, the tubs, but then we had the tanks, and then we had the water towers. And I'll talk through that with you in just a little bit. So the tanks were people that kind of put a little bit more in than they were going to use right away but it was gonna be used pretty soon, right? So think of like a water heater, like a water tank, like I'm gonna use that water in the next day or so, or, or right? So it was people that were like, okay, I know I'm gonna use this soon, uh, but I'm not gonna use it all right now, right? So it's kind of that that water tank mentality where like, I want it available when I need it, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm not, it's not like right this next year, I'm gonna use it. So that's our water tank donors and the water tower donors was the last group. These were people who said, you know what, I'm going to put money into the donor advice fund, and I really want to preserve that. I'll use a little bit of time, maybe put a little bit more in, but I really want to preserve that resource for a long time to come, maybe even pass it on to, to kids and grandkids. Okay, so I'm going to share. So that's our tubs, tanks, and towers models. Uh, this seems to resonate pretty well with people around the country who say, yeah, I, I know people that give in those different ways. And I'm just going to share some, some examples, okay? So this is Kayla, actually... That's not really Kayla's picture and that Kayla's not even really her name, but this is really her quote. So Kayla told us, she said, I put $5 million in every year and then I, I move $5 million out every year. And Kayla is, is a bathtub donor. It's a really big bathtub, you know, 5 million in, 5 million out. But she she even makes a point to try and get it under $1,000 at the end of the year by or under $1,000 because she's she's kind of playing a game with with trying to get it, get it all out. But Kayla's moving money in and out every year and she's a tub donor. She's, you know, that's a $5 million. When I present this to professional fundraisers, I always inevitably get someone says, hey, can you connect with Kayla and, and, and share her email? But um, anyway, so here's, a, here's an example of a tank donor, okay? This is Yael and her husband. They sold a, a winery. They had a liquidity event. They had a wealth this wealth event. She said, we just put a bunch of money into the donor advice funds and we're going to meet it out over the years. But she specifically said, you know, we, we want to do it within a year or two, right? Like, you know, we're going to do it pretty soon, but we just, we're going to move it into the DAF because we had this event and, and, and then we're going to figure out what to do with it. So she's the typical tank donor, right? So someone who's having a large wealth event, hopefully she even, you know, transferred some of the ownership of the, of the uh, vineyard into the, into the DAF before she sold it. Um, but I'll let Dan talk about that in a little bit, uh, but that's your tank donor, right? Kind of putting big chunks in at a given time, then they kind of spend it down. Then maybe they have another big chunk a few years later or five or 10 years later. So that's our tank donor. Finally, we've got David, right? So David sold a business. He put a couple million dollars into this donor advice fund and he set up a budget for himself. He said, I'm only going to spend 5% a year, right? Like an endowment, like a like a charitable endowment, like a, like a private foundation. Uh, and he said, I, I just wanted to stick around, right? He said, I want, I want the fund to stay stable. I want it to grow if possible, right? So he's looking forward to those investments growing. Um, and he also mentioned his kids and grandkids later that he wants them to eventually take over the donor advice fund. So, so hopefully this is helpful to you. We've, we've, we've shown you some data on how, who's using donor advice funds, how donor advice funds are being used in a variety of ways, and then some kind of profiles of the kinds of patterns we're seeing from uh, donor advice fund donors. So I'm going to stop there and I'm going to turn time over to Dan Blake, who's going to talk you through a case. Awesome. Thanks so much, Dan. Uh, the, the research I think is absolutely fascinating. I'm going to share my screen just a second. Um, so we're going to start by talking about, and Dan's done a really fantastic job at teeing up just what is a donor advice fund? How are clients using it? Um, I want to start by talking about why this is also beneficial for you as the financial advisor or the, the wealth manager. There are three stats. This is from uh, another research report. This was a benchmarking study comparing 1,200 independent RIAs and family offices and looking at those that included charitable planning compared to those that did not include charitable planning. Those that did include charitable planning had six times the median assets, uh, three times the amount of organic growth, and I think perhaps um, the most compelling when their client was asked the question, do you view your financial advisor as a multi-generational resource to your family? They scored 27% higher. So I think there's just a, a really solid business case to include charitable planning. And it just so happens that donor advice funds are the, the simplest, the most flexible, 
and really the most tax efficient charitable vehicle that you can use to help with your charitable planning. And we want to go through one case. I'm going to outline the case and then we're going to have Emily show you how you can use Holista Plan to detail out the, the case. And so we're going to talk about this concept of charitable bunching. And this illustrates one of the really powerful tools of donor advised funds. Um, it's a, a simple concept, but you're separating out the timing of your tax deduction from the timing of your charitable giving. And while that seems really simple, it has pretty dramatic results. And so um, that's what this case is going to, to highlight. Um, by separating out the timing of the tax deduction from the timing of your charitable giving, you can optimize for, for both. And so charitable bunching, essentially you're front loading multiple years worth of charitable giving into a DAF into a single year. You can claim an itemized deduction in that year and then distribute the, the funds over time. So let's look at what this, this actually looks like. So we're going to assume that you have a married couple. They're giving away $15,000 a year to several different charities. This might be their local church, the universities that they attended, um, the, the local Boys and Girls Club, the local soup kitchen. And they're, they're doing that pretty consistently, say $15,000 a year every single year. We're going to look at this over a, a five-year period. So um, when they put together their taxes, they're going to have this $15,000 of donations to charities. They have some other deductions, state and local taxes, their mortgage interests. So the total yearly itemized deduction is $31,000, a little bit higher than the standard deduction, uh, $3,300 $3, above the uh, the standard deduction. So the total donations over that five-year period, $75,000, 15,000 times five years. The total tax deduction over that same period is $155,000. So now let's look at what happens if we just change the timing of their giving. And so we're going to move all of their charitable giving, the full $75,000 into a single year and place it into a donor advice fund. And then out of the donor advice fund each year, they can give $15,000 to the, the various different charities. So what this does is it dramatically increases the year one itemized deduction up to $91,000. They're $63,000 above the, the standard deduction. In the subsequent years, they're just going to claim the standard deduction, the $27,700. So the total deduction for years two through five is 110, just over $110,000 based off of that standard deduction. So the total donations over this five-year period hasn't changed. It's still $75,000, but the total tax deduction has now increased to over $201,000. So without charitable bu bunching, the additional savings above the standard deductions, just over $16,000, with charitable bunching, when you really approach your giving from this perspective that you can optimize for the taxes in addition to optimizing for the timing um, that you're giving your funds away, you were able to 3x overall tax savings over that, that five-year period. So there really is a lot of power for you as the financial advisor coming in and helping your clients that are charitably inclined give in the most tax-efficient way. And with that, I'm going to turn the time over to Emily so she can demo how you could do all of this in Holista Plan. Yeah, thank you, Dan. Um, so I'm going to start sharing my screen. And Dan, are you seeing my Holista Plan? right now? Can you give me a thumbs up or yes? I am. Yep. Perfect. Okay. So um, in Holista Plan, pretty easy to model a DAF actually. So the lift might be to actually just create your, in my case, I'm using a 2024 um, scenario example. You could be modeling out even a future year um, of Holista Plan if you wanted to model what would 2023 have looked like if we did a DAF. But here we're just focusing on 2024. So I've created or pre created a 2024 baseline for in this case we're working with Homer and Marge Simpson so um, they are they just feel charitably inclined this year 
they want to share some of the wealth they've earned from the nuclear power plant over over the course. Maybe Homer's getting a big bonus or something. So to actually model what it would look like or how would we set this up, if you scroll down all the way to your Schedule A itemized deductions of Holista plan, you just want to expand that. And this is where we're going to focus on modeling a DAF type scenario. So here you'll see they are gifting the $15,000 each year. And just note that these numbers, they have been updated to be reflective of a 2024 tax year. And then how would I model that bunching strategy inside of Holista Plan? So in my scenario two, we see that same 15,000. If you are a current user of Holista Plan, little tip or trick, if you hover your cursor between the two, we can see the differences between one scenario to the next. So you can see these match right now. So what I want to go ahead and do is click on that charitable worksheet here. And I'm going to focus on this being a cash donation. Um, we would, of course, support if this were a different type of donation. So what do I mean by that? If this were maybe um, a non-cash, non-capital uh, gain donation, what could that be? Maybe you're donating a car or something like that, um, or a capital gains donation, so appreciated stock. What you want to be mindful of is this terminology to 50% limit organizations. These are the data entry boxes you want to focus on when we're working with a DAF strategy inside of Holista Plan. So this 15,000, we're just going to make that the five years of gifting into one, so 75,000. And then if I close out of here, now you'll notice that increase of 60,000. As we scroll through, you'll see that increase. Of course, now they're itemizing versus that standard deduction amount, taxable income dropping. So that um, 75,000, you know, saved in the current year, 20, over $20,000 in tax, and we're dropping them down a marginal bracket and decreasing that effective rate by over 1%. Um, and so out of Holista Plan, we could print this. This could be a nice, you know, live action walkthrough with the client just to bring to life these concepts that can be um, incredibly impactful for, you know, the client situations that you're working with. So that's it. It's pretty simple and straightforward in Holista Plan. Um, but if you guys ever have any questions, if you are a current user or a future current user, just always reach out to our support team. We'd be happy to help you model anything. Awesome. Well, we are going to open it up for Q&A. And Emily, the first question I think is directed at you. What Holista Plan package is needed to create this type of scenario? That's perfect. That's an awesome question. Um, any of our packages would actually support um, the creation of a DAF strategy. And there are just a so many other strategies you could model, but that's all what I showed you today was scenario analysis and all of our subscription tier um, options currently support that feature of the software. So um, if you've heard of Holista Plan before, you probably saw the tax report, which I did not highlight or show today. Um, so that's also included, but then there's also the modeling aspect. So great question. Awesome. Um, so Dan Heist mentioned that uh, in one of these, uh, exa the, I believe it was the tank example of somebody assigning a successor to their donor advised fund. So it looks like we got a handful of questions about that. It's one of the really great things about a donor advised fund is the fact that you can assign successors. You would go on to the, the DAF portal um, and really regardless of where the donor advised fund is at, all DAFs are going to have an option to assign a successor, whether it's your spouse, whether it's your children. There's also the option of splitting the DAF amongst individual people or um, splitting a portion of it to go to a specific charity upon your passing. So there's just a tremendous amount of flexibility in how you deal with the, the succession planning of a, a donor advice fund so that it can, in essence, exist in perpetuity. Dan, I might, I might share one more uh, additional insight on that as well. <clears throat> a lot of people will also uh, name one of their kids or even a grandkid as a, an authorized advisor while they're still alive. And mm -hmm. so they'll, they'll uh, you know, <clears throat> donor advised funds can typically handle multiple advisors that can get online and have their own password and recommend grants. And so a lot of people, we see a lot of people starting to say, okay, kids, like we've got X amount of money in the in the account. We're all going to authorize you to go on and, and and do some some giving on your own. And so then, you know, when when the parents die, they're actually already on there. Uh, so we see people actually doing that as well during their lifetime. So 
both ways work, right? Waiting till you, you pass and, and then the successor advisor takes over or just get them started while you're, while you're still alive. Absolutely. It looks like we have a couple of questions, um, a few different flavors of the, the same question, which is can multiple people donate to the same donor advised fund? Whether it's a corporate DAF, whether it's a church institution setting up a DAF, whether you have your own DAF and you're wanting to host a fundraiser and have friends and families donate to it. So technically, all of that is possible. Different DAF hosts may or may not have additional restrictions on that. Us at UI Charitable Advisors, um, we, we do manage all of that. We have individual DAFs. We would set up a corporate DAF for a corporation that's wanting to have all of their employees or friends of the companies donate to it. You could do a very similar thing for a religious organization. And so the, the, the easy answer is yes, you will want to check with the individual DAF hosts that you are working with to make sure that that is something that they can manage. But at UI Charitable, that is absolutely something that, that we allow for. And then the tax deduction goes to the individual donors. So if I donate to Emily's DAF, I'm the one that gets the, the tax deduction, not, not Emily, unfortunately, for, uh, for her. Um, there's a, another question, and maybe Dan Heiss, you can take this. What happens to the assets in, in the DAF, in the, the tank or the tower scenario where those assets are growing? Are there additional deductions? Is the DAF taxed on that? I mean, how, how are those, how's that appreciation inside the DAF um, what happens to that? Yeah, that is a great question, Dan. And first I'll <clears throat> mention that uh, when you set up the DAF or at any given point after you set up the DAF, uh, typically the donor has some sort of say or advice over how is, what, what kind of investments are, you know, what, what kind of mixes are, are those assets being invested in, right? So if, if you know you want to use this tool for a long term, you might, you know, have higher risk, you might, you know, pick a mix that would <clears throat> be better for long-term growth. If you know you're going to give it away soon, you know, you might want to keep it more liquid and, or just, you know, lower risk. Right. So, so first the donor usually has some say in it. Second, uh, when, when it is invested, all those, all that growth is available. It's gross, it is tax-free and the growth is available for grant making. Right. So remember David who took the tower approach, uh, he only gave away uh, the growth, right? So he put in two million, he gave himself a budget about 5%. It grew more than 5% a year. And so he was just giving away the, the earnings on that, on that account every year. Awesome. Thank you, Dan. It looks like we have another couple of questions and we're coming up against time. Um, but a couple of questions about more complex scenarios. Emily mentioned, maybe you you donate a car, um, Dan mentioned, hopefully when they sold the vineyard, they donated a portion of the vineyard prior to the sale into a DAF instead of just donating cash. Looks like there were a handful of questions around that. Um, DAFs are great because they can deal with these more complex scenarios. You can donate just about any type of asset that you would want into a DAF. Um, at UI Charitable, that's actually one of the things that we specialize in is in helping with these more complex scenarios with some of these more complex assets. But there is a very easy, streamlined way that you can handle all of that. If there are, with some of these individual cases, um, feel free to reach out to us directly, and we'd be happy to, to engage with you. Um, and down here at the bottom, any questions about this research, feel free to reach out to Dan Heist, Dan underscore Heist at byu.edu. And then if there are questions about specific charitable cases, um, how you can incorporate donor advice funds into your practice, setting up donor advice funds, transferring a donor advice fund, feel free to reach out to myself, Dan Blake at uicharitable.org. Um, and then any questions about Holista Plan, which is really the, the best, the simplest, the most elegant uh, software out, out there that you're going to come across. Um, here's their email, success at holistaplan.com. Emily, are there any final comments that, that you'd want to, to share? 
Um, just confirming that this has was recorded today and we will be sending out the recording with the slide deck later. We also um, will likely include um, a few answers to some of the uh, more popular questions that got asked and maybe some that were missed, um, but important to get you all an answer on. Um, but with that, thank you. Thank you everyone for spending this uh, 40 minutes of time with us today. Um, as always, we appreciate you and the work that you're doing. Um, and thank you, Dr. Dan Heist and Daniel for joining us um, and uh, just bringing a, a great webinar to celebrate DAF Day. Yeah, thank you so much. It's always a, a lot of fun. Thanks, yeah. Emily. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Sarah, for having me. Yeah, thanks, everyone. We'll see you.